Oui. D'accord, à tout de suite. Hello, dear audience, wherever you are right now watching, probably from home. I'm happy to welcome here our guests for today's second panel on Can There Be a Global Art? It's already the fourth day of the School of Resistance at uh, the Académie der Künste in Berlin. And I would like to welcome Rabia Moret, Milo Rao, and uh, online uh, Lia Rodriguez and Majdi Muavat. It's a pleasure that you join our panel today. Perhaps some introductory words about the School of Resistance itself. We conceive it as a uh, place for experts of change who think and rethink uh, our strategies, um, our methods, and, and it's a place for discussing what we should be learning and what we should be unlearning. And I think particularly for the topic of today, um, this is a good way to start. Also, I would like to refer to the place we're sitting right now. The cu last couple of days, we were discussing a lot um, tribunals, trials, courtrooms. Uh, in many of, of the works you've done, Milo, this plays a big role. And yesterday, Lara Stahl, in a panel on uh, transnational injustice, justice, uh, spoke about her project, Europe on Trial. And somehow, um, the three of us here and the two of you who are joining we are putting global art production on trial. We are discussing uh, how <coughs> we have been operating so far and what's, what was problematic and what we might be unlearning and learning um, in this pandemic situation. Perhaps let me start with introducing our guests. Lia Rodriguez is a choreographer. She studied classical ballet and history at the University of Sao Paulo and worked for several years in Maguay uh, Marin's company in France. In 1990, she founded the Lia Rodriguez Compagnie de Dancers. Rodriguez has always combined her artistic work with social commitment, something we will be talking about today. This concern culminated in 2004 in the decision to move the center of her company's work to the Favela Mare on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. The cultural center and dance school she founded there is probably one of the topics we will be discussing today. Vashti Muavat is a prolific uh, writer of our times, played on many stages, um, and theatre director. Muavat directed the Centre Centre National des Arts in Ottawa, Canada, from 2007 to 2012, served as an artistic advisor for the Festival d'Avignon, and in the same capacity for the Grand Théâtre Nantes. Um, Muavat has won several prizes and is, since 2016, director of the Théâtre National de la Colline in Paris. And Rabia Moret, to my right, is director, actor, visual artist, writer. He works at the interface of performance and visual arts. In his performances, he often combines real, everyday material with fictional narratives that he develops himself as an author and writer of his performance, performances, combining aesthetics and political research. And uh, we know each other from, uh, particularly from your work at Münchner Kammerspiele, for instance, um, Kill the Audience or Ode to Joy. But there are also many other um, performances, lecture performances with which you have traveled the world, for instance, Sand in the Eyes or Pixelated Revolution. And to my left, Milo Rao, um, who probably goes with a short introduction. He's the director, artistic director of IPM and Antigent and has been here at several panels already. Hello to everyone. Hi. After this rather long introduction, I want to ask uh, a question to everyone, perhaps um, starting with you, Vashti. Where were you when the first lockdown of the arts institutions happened last year? I was in Strasbourg. 
I was getting ready to play. I was to perform a show that I had written and that I had directed and that I was also performing in. And what about you, Lia? Unfortunately. A very good career full of work that will provide our survival in Brazil. And everything was cancelled. I was actually in France and I was able to send back in a very tight moment everybody to Brazil. And I stayed in Europe and I'm here one year now out of my home. Oh, no. I didn't know that. And, and you, Rabia? Yeah, I was in uh, Leipzig uh, preparing for uh, a performance uh, with my partner, Lina Mezdalani. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually one week before the opening uh, and we had to go back home mm -hmm. to Berlin. So. <laughs> and it fits quite well, Lia, what you said about uh, you being stuck here in Europe with what Milo and me probably can narrate about this moment. Perhaps, Milo, you want us to share where you were when, when yeah, all this I started. Was, <laughs> Lia, I was in the, in, the, in the north of Brazil at that very moment in, uh, in Marabá, uh, starting to rehearse for Antigone there with local actors. And, um, and yeah, it stopped. And then somehow over Sao Paulo, we could go back in a week to, uh, to Europe. And then I was stuck in Cologne. Mm -hmm. and, and I myself, to complete the picture, I was in Sao Paulo for, um, for a festival. And we were showing Farm Fatal of Philippe Ken, and it was really the theaters were already closed in, in Europe, but we were still uh, performing. The, question, the, why, the reason I'm asking, uh, and perhaps Leah, you want uh, to reply to this, is what does this tell about the way we were working before the pandemic? How we uh, were working at different places on a global scale, and perhaps also in which way this might have been problematic, because I perceive this very short. Uh, period for a festival uh, in Sao Paulo, traveling there, showing it, the technicians don't even see the city and then they return, is something quite um, problematic and perhaps now it's the moment to reflect upon this. So how did we work on an international scale before the pandemic and what was problematic about it? Leah, did you hear the question? Sorry. I, I, okay, I, I, I heard the question. I didn't know that I <laughs> was me to, to begin. <laughs> Home uh, is a huge uh, subject, let's say like this. I agree. Um, <laughs> especially that uh, uh, nowadays we, we hear a lot of artists that say, ah, let's do something for the environment, not fly anymore. Normally, artists from the north, from rich countries that have a lot of work that d really doesn't need to, to fly, actually. Né? But we, artists of the south, uh, it, especially in Brazil, we don't have any money to support our work. The, all the money is in Europe, in these rich countries. So we have to come here in order to survive there. So this is a tricky uh, thing, but I think we should look a little bit larger to this subject. Not only I am not going to flight, etc., because at least for us uh, from the South, we really need what you have in Europe. You have support, you have a, a réseau of many artists and institutions that we don't have. So how can we survive there without this? And this is, uh, I've, I've been doing uh, many years uh, uh, going in Europe, going back to Brazil, taking money from Europe, you know, the, the other way around that normally uh, was like this. So take the rich the richness that you have in Europe and take to Brazil to promote art there, to survive there, to make survive not only my artistic uh, work, because this is not the, the main point in my life, but to, to, uh, to make a project in the favela work art center there to give a, a way to living for many many people there to um, support the dance school with more than 300 students so we need support and money for the for this 
I'm sure we will return to this aspect of hacking the system uh, in order to mobilize solidarity. Perhaps to you, Vashti, also the same question. How did we collaborate on an international scale before the pandemic? And perhaps also what was problematic about it? Eh bien, je, je poursuis un peu la réflexion de l'IA, c'est-à-dire euh, euh, il y a le fait que euh, c'est la question que vous posez, euh, je pense qu'elle elle ne se pose qu'à partir de l'Europe, pour les raisons que l'IA a... Mais... Alors, c'est moi qui vous entends, c'est moi qui suis en train de vous entendre. Je pense qu'il faut que... On, on t'entend. We, we, can, we can more or less hear I, you. I apologize. Um, Donc, je, je, okay. je vais recommencer. Okay. Je disais que... We start again. Euh, I was saying that... Disait, euh, I was saying that building on what Lia was saying, the question that you asked is a question that can only be posed from the point of view of Europe. You have to be European to ask this kind of question because indeed it is very complex. Europe is precisely the locus of financial power with regards to artistic creation. And I won't repeat what uh, Leah said, but I will um, speak from the perspective of Quebec, where I was largely educated, even if now I work largely in France. In Quebec, there is a festival that is very important that you may might know. It's the um, Theatre Festival of the Americas. If that festival hadn't existed, it would have been entirely impossible for artists from Quebec to confront themselves and compare themselves to the global artists. If artists of South America hadn't come to Montréal, if this festival hadn't invited Alain Platel, Nina Gawa, uh, Afghan artists, African artists, South American artists, if these companies hadn't been able to move by plane to Montréal, an entire generation of artists from Quebec would not have been able to evolve because Quebec is a small society in terms of population, surrounded in a little island surrounded by anglophone areas, and um, we could have ended up dying uh, or becoming somehow incestuous artistically by keeping working together with the same people, by having always the same points of view. And it's due and thanks to the foreign artists that many artists from Quebec have been able to develop their art because they have been confronted with artistic forms and ideas that were extremely powerful and have been able to call into question their own work of art. If, starting from today, artists stop moving for all kinds of probably good reasons, Artists of the countries that we go to lose the possibility to confront themselves with other art. What is interesting is that if we were having this debate in Montréal, I think that we would not be asking this question. Mm -hmm. Javier, you also said it's a, a problem, like a complex, difficult question I'm raising. Yeah, it's it's difficult because, like, uh, I think, like, to answer of. Uh, how is it going today during the pandemic? We have to go through how it was before, like, and how it changed. Maybe I don't want to go before it, just like to, to talk about something for me. I think it's interesting. It's like, uh, especially for the first uh, six months of the pandemic, uh, there was something uh, very uh, noticeable and to recognize it is that... Uh, the center of like is as Europe as the center as uh, Wajdi was saying, uh, it was decentralized mm. uh, with the pandemic, and this has actually uh, created something of uh, global equality in the world. Like for the first time, for example, uh, in Lebanon, you know, like in October there was a revolution in October 19, uh, 2019, and then uh, the pandemic came. 
uh, to like fading it out like uh, it's like repressing it in addition to the to the to the authorities uh, in Lebanon but at the same time there was something for the Lebanese uh, uh, fine i felt it also is that for the first time we don't feel that we are alone facing this uh, this enemy it's actually the whole world together and one thing that i would like to to talk about is that during a year uh, maybe more or less uh, the quality of art and what artists are presenting was not important anymore during this year what was important is that this solidarity between all the artists and the world and especially the countries that were really suffering for example italy at that time it was like a, a big issue in europe and in the world uh, and then spain and france and like of course a lot a lot of uh, of countries uh, but it was like for the first time i felt myself like it doesn't matter the quality of the work like if i'm presenting of someone of of like an artist or like a festival that sometimes i'm not convinced with with the quality or like quality intellectually or or like practically so it was not really important the important thing is just like to to have this solidarity with each other and this is something we didn't have it before at least for me i was all the time uh, questioning all the time why I'm participating in this festival, why they are inviting me, uh, from where the money is coming, should I accept, should not I accept, what is the image that they, they have about me, why are they inviting, all these questions mm. disappeared in the pandemic, mm. in a way. It's interesting that you're raising that because actually when I was uh, asking the question, I was not so much uh, problematizing um, the global uh, collaboration on the level of uh, ecological questions, but more we have here the sentence, decolonize a spectacle. Um, and I felt sometimes that um, this international form of collaboration, these festivals, as you were saying, why do they invite me? What is the gesture? What is, uh, in which way is it to show something, to exercise something? Or is it um, just to, to, to give a short visibility to something, then to feel better in a bourgeois way, and then to retrace from the, from the question of solidarity? And that's why I'm also problematizing how did we work and in which... Uh, forms of production that we perhaps participate uh, with our artistic work and that's perhaps leads also to you Milo. how do you look back to the time before the pandemic and the international collaboration um i i i just to come back what i just heard from from uh, from lia and from vashti and, and also from rabbi um and from you um it's very interesting how focused you still are even being in a global system of exchange of art and everything that I think many people never heard the statement in Europe like the one from, from Lia now. I didn't read it in any theatre journal, this problem, problematization of not flying anymore and not exchanging anymore and who pays the, the, the price for it. Because where is the center of this, all this, this what you call richness, all this, this money, and also of the symbolic capital on the schools you can go and, and so on and so on. And it's everything in Europe. And of course, it's simple to stay in Europe. So now we stay in Europe uh, as we did it for so long time, while the global economy, of course, is continuing and the managers are flying and so on and so on. So I think the first step for me is to, and that's, I think, uh, if I remember well, was also the reason why we started this School of Resistance to really confront the, the very limited uh, perspective we can have on global problems by, by the life, by the milieu, by just the reality, how we construct our knowledge and our practice mm. to widen it, to open it and to find then solutions together on a, on a, on a, on a, on a global level. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's what is interesting for me. And of course, I can now talk a lot about uh, how I was starting to think about it, but I think I'm in that way I'm a really a cliche European artist that decided immediately we have to have less touring, we have to have more sustainable forms of producing in my theatre in in Ghent, and I, I, I don't think that this is worthless. Mm. Still, I think, but it's only a part of the of the problem. I think I think this will lead us to one of the the core questions of what we are trying to understand today or learning and unlearning. 
what is our relation to a specific territory, a so specific social context in which we are working, and how do, do we make this visible or mo mobile uh, in a global context? And I would, in this case, like to start with you, Leah. Perhaps you can tell a bit about, you mentioned the school already, um, how you work in a specific place, a specific social territory, but at the same time, you travel with your work uh, globally and how you see the relation between these two poles. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm speaking from a very specific place related to Brazil. I am a, a white woman. I am uh, from middle class, and this means a lot in my country. Uh, so I had I had many privileges that um, a lot of people, they cannot have. So I could be an artist, first of all. So I had all my my career as a, a dancer, a choreographer, but I'm very committed since ever with what's happening in my country. Is uh, uh, when I heard about uh, solidarity in times of uh, of Corona or even before, I don't see a, a, a huge change. And I think the the pandemic hit differently in different countries. Uh, as you can imagine, the pandemic hit Brazil in a very, very, very hard way uh, because we don't have only the pandemic. We are now the second country to have more people dying mm. and we are in a ca completely chaos there. So this, this uh, creates a completely different uh, um, uh, form of solidarity. Of course, we have, we have a lot of solidarity in Brazil, the place where I work, the NGO with whom I work in the favela made a huge campaign to give just food to people that uh, don't have nothing to eat. 17 families. Uh, but I you go to your specific your question. So I, I work and, and uh, uh, I made my artistic and pedagogical work in this territory. It's a, a huge favela with uh, 100 40,000 inhabitants is, is uh, bigger than 8% of the cities in, in Brazil. And of course, it's completely doesn't have uh, many, um, uh, uh, how to say, infra uh, infrastructure for their lives. Um, it's a very hard life, specific, more, more and more now in the pandemic times, but still with violence, with, but at, in another hand, they have a very uh, a life life. Let's say like this: people are uh, able to create, to to reinvent themselves because life for them say every day no, and they have to reinvent themselves and say every day yes to life. So I learn a lot. So I arrived there without a, a project, but just together with this NGO that is. Uh, uh, lead by people that born in the favela. This is a huge difference also. So together we decided to create art center and we created this art center for in a huge space that was completely destroyed. We still, <laughs> the past 10 years, we tried to raise money to do, to uh, make some works there. And then this dance school uh, in 2011, and you have these 300 students for all ages. But it's also the where I work, where I made my creations, where uh, I'm always in the in this very specific um, place that I have to ask questions myself every day, every day. What I'm doing there, I have to have a radical listening to people that lives there, and. Uh, to uh, to speak about my relation with Europe, as I said in the in the first uh, question, that uh, I have uh, the support of many institutions in Europe. Luckily, otherwise I would not able to follow my work. I don't know in which way I will follow my work. So I try to because it, when I I am in Brazil, I have to deal with this specific territory that uh, ask me many questions. But when I arrive in Europe with my work also, I'm seen as a, a, a Latin American artist. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very complicated and complex and very interesting to be in these two places all the time, traveling from one to the other. Thank you. 
Perhaps also um, the same question to Vashti, how does the specific place we work in relate um, to the way we collaborate on an international level and also combining it perhaps with a question from the audience? How can we deconstruct a European-centered solidarity and instead create a decolonial solidarity? Global. Mm. Global. Euh, alors, je ne peux parler que à partir du, de l'endroit d'où je regarde. I can of course only speak Et, uh, from the point of view that I am speaking from. As opposed to Lia, I am in the entirely opposed situation. Everything that I do as an artist, for instance, if we speak about my artistic work, everything that I do, everything that I have written, everything, absolutely everything that I do, I always address the Lebanese. I write plays starting from Lebanon. I begin with this exile. Nonetheless, all the plays that I have done, that I've written, I've written them with actors that are not Lebanese. I have worked with uh, actors in Quebec for spectators in Quebec because theatre is particular in that as opposed to cinema, a theater play is for the spectators that are roughly uh, three miles around the theater. 90% of the spectators live close to the theater, not far away. So this is the people that you address. All the while, everything that I talk about talks about an injury um, that has occurred in a country that is thousands of kilometers away. I myself, therefore, I'm always decentered. I never live in the place from where I write. I don't live in my emotional territory. I live in other territories. And everything I write, I write it together with artists that do not know anything about the situation that I describe. I keep describing the war in Lebanon to actors in Quebec. I have to transmit this to them so that they can carry the work. And there's not only the actors, but there's also the spectators. So I am telling to spectators who are not concerned by this question, this question that is far away from them. Only once have I had the opportunity to go perform these plays in Lebanon. This was the only time in my life where I had the impression that those that I write for heard me. The rest of the time, I'm entirely decentralized. So my relationship to territory is rather paradoxical. Right now, I'm directing the theater Théâtre de la Colline that is situated in Paris in a very um, popular down-to-earth area. It used to be called the Theater of the Parisian East. It's still a working class uh, area of Paris, a little bit. And currently, I am in the process of rehearsing a performance that takes its starting point with an explosion that has occurred in the in Beirut, and I do this with French actors, and I spend my day asking myself the question, how I can make sense of what I want to narrate here to a spectator whose story this isn't at all. How can I, when I write, when I direct, 
open up the theater. For example, at the moment, the situation that we're in right now, which is that we're not performing, I've decided to open the rehearsals. They're open all the time. Every day, people that I don't know at all come. It's very limited. There's about 10 people. They come, they sit down, and they watch us rehearse. And that is the way that I have found to share, to share this lucky situation that we are in, that we can be rehearsing and can be working. So I'm staging a story that doesn't regard the people that come and watch at all. But as soon as somebody sits in the theater space, I start looking at them, I start looking for what I see in their eyes, and I start to shift a little bit what I'm doing. I have never asked myself the question why I was invited to the countries that I was invited to. I'm so busy with how to create a relation between the spectator that lives right next to the theater uh, with a story that happens so far away from him. My problem for the past 30 years has so often been that I am not really addressing the audience that I would like to address. That when somebody says, uh, I want your show to come to our festival, I want it to travel, I say, sure, fine, I'm very happy. But it doesn't really console me because I find myself performing in Spain and Germany. I'm happy because I know that it reaches people, but the audience that I would want to address to, I am never addressing. It's as if Leah was doing choreographies but was never presenting them in Marais, where she lives. As if she was presenting them everywhere in the world, except for in this favela. And this creates a relationship to the world that is rather strange. When I hear words during the pandemic, such as mutant, the virus has muted, or there's variation, I always feel like I'm talk like one is talking about myself. I'm a mutant, I'm a variant, when I started leaving my country, and I'm, I keep being a variant, and I can't return to the center. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> For sharing that, and I'm sure and, and curious um, that uh, Rabia, you have plenty to to react hearing all this. <laughs> hey, plenty, okay. <laughs> and, um, first of all, like to come to this question, how like to to deconstruct uh, the European uh, centered sol solidarity? It's just like I'm I'm uh, I'm wondering like it's first of all how can I like as a Lebanese coming from uh, countries where like there are wars and uh, catastrophes like a uh, region which is still in conflicts etc how like i first of all how i can convince the europeans if we are talking about the europeans but also the global the the world not to look at me as a victim not to to reproduce me again as a victim so if I want to come to a festival, not because I'm a victim, because this is actually the, the, the problem where whenever there's a catastrophe, the world runs to and like open the microphones, the, the cameras for those people to, to bring them and invite them and money goes there to produce for them. And, but what they want from them, they want them as victims, not as an active uh, agent. Uh, agent. Yes. So whenever they become active agents, they are not welcome at all. You have to fight for this. You have to resist all the time for this. And it's not, it's not an easy thing for, for those countries that are coming from the margin, from, like, from poor countries where there are like, uh, conflicts. And a lot, a lot of artists, if I want to say like the majority of the artists from these countries paid the price uh, in, 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 in the two senses. Either they, are, they pay the, the price that they are excluded, they are not invited at all, or they actually they accept the game and they produce themselves as victims. 
and they are like become like stars or like uh, uh, invited everywhere, etc. Very, very few people maybe they resisted this and they succeeded to find a place. Uh, I don't know this. And if I may ask, is there something about the production structures and also the structures of the finance behind? What kind of Uh, of sharing what kind of uh, art production is being financed? Do we have a very short-lived uh, spectacle and we are not really interested in engaging in a... It's, there is uh, there's agendas all the time in, in, the, in people who organize things, who has the power to organize things, people who have the money to organize things. They have agendas all the time, most of the time, and they have to fill, fulfill this agenda. So, they, of course, they have to look where they can find uh, things, uh, works, uh, people that they can uh, uh, fit their agendas. And those who doesn't fit, they are not there. Simply, it's simply as this, it's very violent. Really, it's very violent. And it's, the, the agenda is all the time changing. There are some people very clever, they can like play with this agenda. I mean, like from outside. Yeah. And also from the inside, it's like a double also. It's also from, from the center also. It's a problematic. It's not only for the margin. Yeah. Because also this agenda is also is... The, 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 the issue also is that they don't create their agendas also. Mm. It's also there are someone who is giving this agenda and giving the money according to this agenda. And, and it's all the time uh, you have to this is why like i'm saying like i'm all the time skeptical doubtful i i i'm all the time afraid to participate in 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 whatever festival uh, i don't say that i succeed to to have like a good selection or like to no of course no because like it's it's a, it's it's a, a big machine going on it's a, it's really a, Uh, but I, I'm always, always skeptical, always questionable about this. I think this concept of agenda setting is very interesting also in the context of your work, Milo. And also in this context, I wanted to, uh, to <coughs> mention the, the book and also the, the work you, you've done around the concept of global realism. Um, and perhaps this has something to do also with setting agendas and creating work conte context of your own. Yeah, I, 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 I want to perhaps to, to come on something that uh, Rappi was saying, because uh, what for me is very interesting, of there's an economy of compassion, I think, in the art sector, in the bourgeois art sector, that you would be invited, as you said, because you are a, a victim of a conflict, or you live the conflict, you have a stash, special biography, and, and some years ago, or five years ago, six years ago, I made a play, Compassion, what was exactly about, why are you always exposed as a as a victim, and why is there this kind of struggle of being a victim even in places where there are no victims, you know, somehow when you enter the art sector? And why is there this place in society? And that's for me, the, as, a, as a Marxist, the most scaring part where being a victim is good, while in all the other places it's a huge problem. Right. And you can't capitalize it. You can only capitalize it in these festivals. And uh, why did we create this economy of compassion and of being a victim and you go around in the world and why does it exist? Why did we create this counter world, which is somehow where we give agency to people that when they step uh, 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 one step aside, don't have any more, you know? And we have never ending discussions about what is the percentage of agency in that room. And I think that room in general is wrong. The way how we represent, uh, it becomes now a bit, let's say general, I know, but how we represent the world in art perhaps is wrong. Perhaps we have to find other ways of representation. As, as Vashti described and as Leah described, that like on really landing somewhere or really accepting the exile or really trying to do activism and not art or really just working on your stuff and I'm not interested in including however you know, kind of rejecting all this neoliberal like tolerance, inclusion, agency and question the things. And what would it mean? Because they are all beautiful concepts, but what would it mean basically? And then we come to the global realism. How can you change actually a system where you have a parallelity of global exploitation and global compassion? 
how can you kind of reflect on what you would like to do as an artist and an intellectual into real, let's say, for example, the distribution of a work, the kind of how you produce a work, how the institutions are done, where you work to do it. And I think the only thing we can do at the very moment is, uh, is criticizing it, is perhaps somehow escaping it. But for me personally, it's really to... And that's why I think what, what, what Leah does and what, what Vashti does is for me beautiful to say, okay, we land on that place, on Arterie, and there we try to do a work that is really senseful and has a time and has a, its own complexity, which is incredible, you know? And you try to decolonize, I mean, your neighborhood some, <laughs> somehow. And uh, I think that's what, what I'm also interested in the very moment, to say, okay, what is this project? What is this actually? But um, I'm, I'm less exposed to it than you, Rabi, because I, I, I'm, I, as, as, as Vashti, I became the director of a huge institution, uh, or not so huge, but still a, a city theater. So I have some chances to to reconstruct it, limited, but still they are there. And I have a neighborhood, you know, even if I'm not from Belgium and etc. I, I want to add one thought about, because we are always talking about Europe, and I think Europe is colonized too. I mean, you have to go to South Italy, to South Spain, to Eastern Europe, to wherever, and you will find a totally other Europe than in these uh, festivals or in yeah. Berlin or in, right. in Paris, of course. Yeah. So there is no Europe that is kind of colonizing the world. We are all the time colonizing ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is exactly also, I, I would refer also to the same point to, for also Wajdi that was saying like about the, the audience in, in Lebanon, uh, Wajdi, is that also this is something, uh, because I, I lived there most my entire life there, but also I didn't feel that I'm reaching the, 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 the real audience in Lebanon. I was like, it was a very, very limited audience and the rest are like, you cannot reach them. And they are like, we are in, in, a, in, uh, in a valley, as we say, and they are in another valley. This is a Lebanese expression. <laughs> so just like to say like, yes, really, when you go from one part to another part in the same country, it, you can you can find that there as like also the power game is there and it's violent how like they exclude each other or like how how they do like this uh, uh, violence relation and re repressing each other so i mean there's definitely a um a construction of 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 centrality and periphery and uh, gravity and margins going on all the time and perhaps this leads me back to the one of the questions we had at the very beginning uh, leah when you somehow ex showed how important it is to hack the system um, to mobilize resources uh, for other communities but also perhaps for uh, for other forms of art um, perhaps you can go a bit into this question of how, how we should be um, hacking the this, this system in order to, to really uh, mobilize resources and solidarity. I don't know, but I have some things that I want to say uh, about the victim, for example. I don't, uh, I don't see us Brazilians as our vit victims. Also, I don't see myself uh, uh, victimized. I don't know how to say this in English. <laughs> Uh, I think we have a huge knowledge in Brazil, especially, you know, indigenous people, black people, people from the periphery, they don't feel th themselves victims. Of course, living in a, in a country as we live, that each 23 minutes a black, a young black boy is killed, makes the whole difference from everything that you do, art or not art. So this is one thing. Then I would like to we speak about audience, uh, I present my works always in Maré since the beginning. Uh, I stayed there for one month, playing five days a week. And th this is very important for me. And there is no difference uh, from the audience in Europe and the audience there in Maré. Um, so we, I try to, uh, to really stay in this place, showing my work as an artist and be... Uh, um, social make social projects and art projects, but then to to come to uh, I and also to to say that uh, I I know very well that the Europe uh, that I I I I'm referring 
is not this the Europe that is the poor Europe is of course where the money is concentrated, and I know that Europe is not only one. Uh, but, but can you re uh, repeat your question, please? Because I I, I lost myself in my own. <laughs> no, at the beginning you were referring to uh, how important it was that um, international travels were possible. Because then bringing, uh, coming to Europe, hacking the system, earning the money, and then that enabled again um, work back in Brazil. That this this procedure was also something to to mobilize resources. And you said how important mm -hmm. it was and how difficult that it stopped. So in which way um, can we transform or hack uh, the the system in place in order to really um, enable a different form of of global collaboration? I think we have first, uh, first of, of all, we have to have a radical listening for different voices. Uh, we have to step out of our center. Ah, it's my work. I can do it. I, I want to. Uh, if I can do my work, I, re I have the right to do my work in the way I believe. I think we have to stop, to step out and leave other voices that there there is no place for the vo these voices uh, nowadays and since long time is uh, i think this is a radical listening uh, open uh, the place you 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 have if you have a lot of power in your in your career you can step out a little bit and give place to others mm. is is what i try to do uh, very little but i think Everybody can invent different forms uh, to uh, to uh, wreck the system. I don't know if I'm wrecking the system. I just do what I need to do, what I see in front of my eyes, what I uh, is uh, is a necessity. I, I cannot do differently. Uh, sometimes I struggle uh, with my career as an artist. Uh, if uh, if I am an artist or or. I'm doing social projects, but I let these questions float a little bit in order to go on. I'm, I'm a very practical person. I have to build something uh, concrete. Uh, so I try to, to deal with all my questioning about all these things, but to follow building concrete. Uh, so space, the school, my work and go there. Uh, follow to raise money I, i'm raising money uh for to to the roof that is falling down nowadays so uh, i'm trying to i'm very concrete because i think this is what my country asks me so I, i'm trying to answer with my my work as an artist but also with very concrete actions Vashti, probably um being like in a in a the place of centrality like paris um, the 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 way we have to operate is a bit different. So I would be curious about what you say, what we have to unlearn. Um, for instance, directing in a European arts institution. This is a very good question. For me, at least, the conclusion that I have reached with regards to this pandemic is that what I have to learn right now, and what I will say is uh, not just an idea, it will have very concrete consequences, what I need to learn is to create outside of institutions. I have to get out of the institutions entirely. I don't only need to stop directing those institutions, but I need to create outside of the institutions and independently of them. And since I don't know yet what that means and how to do this, you know, it's not very complicated. Political power definitely needs to know two things. Once, what are doing its scientists and what are its artists doing? Because those are the two areas of research. Mm. As long as through a system of financial support, um, 
demands from artists to um, explain and present its projects. As long as you need to say, I will do this and that, I will do this for the youth, etc., etc., the politician looks at this and says, ah, this is a nice kid, this is a good kid, he's interesting, he's not dangerous, this is all right. The same is done to academics and scientists in the domain of research. This means that the political world, even if they're not aware of it, they absolutely need to know what artists and scientists are doing. And for me, this is also a kind of a framework that you have to fit in. You uh, go to school, art school, then you found a company, and you continue to enter in this machinery that is institutionalized. At a certain point, you start directing institutions, and you don't always ask yourself the right questions. Those questions that Rabia has mentioned, why am I invited? You are maybe honored or flattered, you want to go. And it's also marvelous to hear that you are loved. Um, an important director tells you as an artist, I love you, and you think, uh, thank you so much, of course I'm going. Everything that I'm saying now, I, I'm talking only about me, of course. But I've realized that which made me start writing is that when I was a young man and I was unknown, I wasn't part of any institution, I was just at home dreaming, having ideas. And this thing is very important to me. The pandemic has led me to ask myself, what would happen if you started creating outside of institutions? And since I didn't get an answer, I don't know exactly how to do it. Structurally, economically, I don't know how to. I don't know how to organize that kind of work. So I wonder if not Maybe this might be the most interesting approach. Maybe, to be very concrete, maybe I don't need to prolong my contract as a director of the Théâtre de la Colline. Maybe if I'm offered the direction of another institution, even if it's flamboyant, maybe I have to say, no, I'm not taking it. Maybe I have to get out of the institutions. And to answer the question of decolonization and of a new interrogation, I think that it is impossible to answer to that uh, from a situation such as the one that I am in. I cannot answer this question if I don't make my body the answer to this question. I can't respond to this question and continue working for a space that gives me a salary, that gives me a space and means to work. This would be hypocritical. I have to get out of the institution first to really begin a renaissance of my relationship with this thing that I love most in the world, which is creating. Mm -hmm. You mentioned and explained both what it means to uh, to be in an institution and um, the hypocrisy, the difficulties of transforming and what it means to be outside an, of an institution. Mila, that, I would like to bring that to you because um, you said that you are artist director of Ente Gent and you start with a very specific mani manifesto, the Gent Manifesto at the beginning. So this is a, a way to from the start, from scratch, transform the institution. But you also operate a lot outside the institutions on purpose, probably. So perhaps, what is the difference in operating in these two systems? What, what, are, what where is the hypocrisy and where are the, are the opportunities? Um, I, I, when I became artistic director of, of, uh, of, of Entegen two years ago, or two and a half years ago, it was my first fixed contract ever. And my, my mother was very happy that I, I finally had with more than 40 years a, a contract. And uh, it, it's true that, uh, it's just true that especially now in the, in, the, in the times of Corona, it gives you safety. You know that you will not be kind of lost if you can't produce. You can even afford you to not produce. You can even say, let's produce and not sell. You can, you can do a lot of things if you are in an institution. On the other side, I would, I would like to question a bit what, uh, what Washti is saying, um, <laughs> that you can't be 
kind of, uh, let's say, that it is impossible to decolonize institutions from the inside. So that's, I mean, perhaps I short it too much, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it 100% and don't even think it in your case, Vashti, because uh, what you are doing in the Theater de la Colline is somehow decolonizing the, the, the institution, how you work, how you invite the public, what public you invite, what work you do, how you tour it, and so on. So you can use, I'm not anti-institutional, so how you use institutions is, is really, and sometimes it means like in the Ghent Manifesto really explode it. So we don't have the white classicals anymore. We don't have this, this ensemble that can only play Shakespeare because it's made of old white men and old white women, and they can only play Shakespeare because that's the, it's the, it's the, and, and, and Chekhov. So we have to have kind of a decolonized uh, ensemble and so on. <laughs> and that you, of course, by purpose invite uh, other people. Or we try, for example, when we go to Mosul, it's not to, to know more about uh, Mosul like journalists would do, but it's, and we will talk about this this evening, it's to invest at least 20% of our budget in creating a, a film institute there together with the Academy of the Arts of, of, of Mosul. So it's, it's what we have in the point eight of the manifesto saying you have to land every year somewhere with your big European institutions outside this institution, not invite people, but just bring cultural infrastructure somewhere somewhere else and then uh, leave it there as we did it with the, with the Congo Tribune. I think privileges and being an institution is also something that for me it would be hypocritical to not work with it and to not use it in, in, the, in the way we do and as we have access um, and perhaps we are the, only the second generations of leftists that have access to, to this kind of institutions. It's not so, it's not so common, too, that from the, from the off-scene you can enter these, these institutions. We should use it and we should, we should transform them. And sometimes they are stronger than we are. Mm. And then we, we, we have to be strategic. Um, and at the moment when I understand that I am, um, let's say... Uh, uh, I arrived on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a position where what I say and what I do is completely disconnected and not only a bit disconnected uh, as it might be in, in every life, uh, then I would also stop it and I have to say to now I, I met uh, Vashti again um, that of course all one, two months I am thinking tomorrow I stop it. I'm, not, I'm somehow not strong enough, you know. I'm not bureaucratic enough to do this struggle. But still, I'm going on, and uh, we will see how it uh, how it ends. Somehow, I would turn it around. Uh, the day you notice you wouldn't be uh, prepared to stop, you should stop, because then, if, then like the if the attractiveness of being part of of the institutions and the system is so big. No, I mean it's it's the economy of love. Actually, when you are on the head of an institution, when you are in an institution, it's like when you are all the time in a festival. And you are surrounded by, by a, a kind of a microcosmos where you are somehow loved and you are somehow needed. And I think that's for many people a reason why you would work in a group. It's also the description of solidarity. It's also beautiful. We don't have only to, to, to criticize it. But of course, in the moment when you understand uh, to be loved is more important than... Uh, uh, to do your job, perhaps it's, it's, it's dangerous. I don't know, there is, I can end with a quote of, of Bertolt Brecht that I like a lot. Uh, he said, when there is city A, where there is a necessity and the people need me, and there is a city B, where people love me, I would prefer to live in city A. And I think that's perhaps the answer on your, on your question. To add a footnote, since we mentioned the Ghent Manifest, uh, which, is of, which of the Ten Commandments is your favorite? Mm -hmm. um, I hope you, you ever read this, but it, it might be completely mysterious what you are talking about now. Um, um, I, 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 I have actually the... the and, and I, have, I found it again with, with Vashti and also with, with Leah, the, I think it's the second one. Um, Theatre is not a product, it is a production process. Research, castings, rehearsals and related debates must be publicly accessible, so that you don't work for premieres and then you open up and you show the premiere. But the premiere is just one day in, in, in your life of, of, of having an exchange. 
And that's why we have, uh, yeah, all rehearsals are open, and that's my, I think it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. Fabia, um, probably there are different things uh, that have been mentioned you want to react to, but I add one more question and then you can uh, pick your path. Uh, because I wanted to ask you the, the title we gave to this conversation, Can There Be Global Art? is of course um, uh, we use it in a way to pr to make it like to problematize it uh, this concept of of uh, the global sphere and the global art so do you think that this is a misleading concept a problematic concept a wrong conception of of exchange it's uh, i don't know i i i just find it problematic to to be honest it's like uh, to think global uh, or even to think local. I don't know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like you are, like in a way, creating like kind of a binaries, which is like, I think, like I'm, I'm interested in uh, actually in in the process, as you said, with this uh, uh, statement and your manifesto is like the process, the research, the 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 the, the way of of thinking and reflecting upon things uh, and i'm i'm a person who uh, actually insists like if you want to do a work about uh, about a topic that you don't go for generalization just to to go for the global huh mm -hmm. so it's like for me is is like as much as you are precise as much as you go into the details of the details like as um, Wajdi and Leah all the time they are insisting that when we talk we're talking about ourselves our 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 conditions it's not about uh, like representing uh, brazil or sao paulo or like uh, whatever artist no i'm talking about myself but like when i talk about the wars uh, or the war there are like if the war with a big capital it's problematic so which war we are talking about? It's about this war that happened in that day, at that moment, in that place. Not any war. And then you can find all the, the, the political background, the social background, everything around it, dig inside it, around it, in order to talk about it. And I don't mind if the audience uh, could grasp the details, the nuances or not. It's fine. I think... Uh, this is also something uh, some artists, and I don't want to generalize, but also there are some also uh, producers, they are always afraid that, but the audience will not understand. We have to make like footnotes or like uh, a glossary or a glossary or introductions. This is, I think, this is the, it's in a way they un underestimate the audience. They think that they are cleverer than the audience or, they, or the artist is, is cleverer than the audience. Or like I know and they don't know and I'm here to teach them or like to give them knowledge about my country or this event or whatever. This is, I think this is a problematic issue. Uh, I think like when I do a work, I do it and I presented it in Beirut as I presented it in Berlin, as it is in Japan, Tokyo or wherever. The same without any changings. And I always have the same feeling that people can understand. And even if in, in, in Tokyo they will miss a lot of the nuances because they don't, have, they don't know the history of my country, if I'm talking about my country, which is fine. But they know the history of their country very well, which I don't know. And they can make associations with what I'm talking about, with their histories, with their own experience. And then exactly it's the, the representation or the presentation and the performance itself, the opening itself, is not that important as much as the encounter after. When we start to, to discuss and to, to, to give a dialogue, to make a dialogue and then do this exchange. So the performance that you present is, is a kind of sharing yeah. with the audience something. And then they share with you with other things. And this is how, how I see it. So, so it's, it's global, local. <laughs> I don't so the, know. The, the show is also one step in this process. You, all of you, are uh, of course, expressing this. Of this course, it's 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 uh, for me. It's the 
for me, I, I do like three phases. This is how I, I see the, the process of like creating or like doing a work better than using the word creating. I don't like it. Doing a work, an artwork, it's in three phases. The, the, the first phase when you work alone or with a group, with the process, with the research, uh, etc., which you don't think about your audience. You don't know to whom you are addressing. It's actually you are addressing it to yourself, to, to the people you are working. We, we are thinking, you are provoking yourself, you are questioning yourself, you are pleasing yourself. It's your pleasure, it's your torturing, it's all of this. <laughs> huh? uh, then the second phase is when you, when you share this when you see like, okay, this moment, I want to stop it because it's endless research. It can go on, go on. So let's stop it here and share with the audience what I have now. So this is the performance. Mm. And the third phase is the, the very important one. When you start to meet with the audience as individuals, when each one of them has a voice, has, yeah. uh, has a political presence, and everyone has uh, the ability to to uh, articulate her own uh, ideas and questions and thoughts and the debate that comes out of it. So it's when you come back to this yeah. equality with, with, with the audience. For instance, in, in Münchner Kammerspiele with your work, uh, Kill the Audience, there was always an after-talk to every performance. And the, right. like the, 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 the after-talk was really sometimes an hour. It was almost as long as the performance itself because exactly. everyone was so engaged in discussing. Right. Um, we talked a lot about uh, uh, processes. You, you mentioned how important it is for you. Vashti also explained that he's now inviting audience to the rehearsals. Uh, Lee, as I would like to ask two questions to you. One is, how um, is the artistic uh, process when you work um, in, the, in the studio, uh, in the dancing school? And also, how is the process with the specific people you're working with and the rest of the people around? Uh, and the second question, because all of you mentioned audiences, and I'm quite glad that, that we're talking about this. And I would, would also be interested because you said something about the audience there, but how do you feel um, the interaction with audiences when you travel to festivals? Is there any form, any form of engagement, as Rabia was asking for? So I was uh, thinking about when Habi was speaking about this meeting, uh, with the audience, uh, Centro de Artes da Maré, where I, I work, there is no doors, it's the, the door are open because the house is very hot, you cannot close, it's the only place that can a little bit the fresh air can enter. So a lot of people enter during the rehearsal, a lot of uh, young students that pass by and they want to drink water, we have uh, drinking water inside, or sometimes this uh, people, crack people that lives in the streets, sometimes they enter then and they, they are inside my rehearsal. I have to stop many, many times during my, uh, when I'm doing, I like this, doing a piece because many things happen at the same time. Uh, so I think this is the first meeting with a kind of audience because they are very curious always. Uh, as uh, we have two spaces and uh, many activities are in the other space, there is also no door. So uh, a lot of students from the dance school or other things that we do, they visit us during the rehearsal, etc. So there is a real uh, interaction. And uh, with the audience, as we play, uh, sometimes we play, we have a lot of conversations after and sometimes before the piece. Uh, sometimes when you have, uh, for example, naked bodies in the piece, this is, can be problematic inside the favela, but not always, but we have to a little bit talk about it before. And after also, because people come to you to see, and, and before, as there is no this relation as in the theater that is separate, they are there, we, we drink or eat together. It's always this thing that eat together before uh, the, the performance and after the performance. So before I have to, come on, we are going to begin our performance. We use the same toilet uh, 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 to change our clothes and, for the audience. So we have a really 
interaction like this. And uh, when I go to theaters in Europe, which, uh, of course, is completely different, uh, first to set up a piece that was created in this space in a black box or in another space. For me, sometimes I struggle because I miss the hitting, I miss the noises, I miss the life that <laughs> is interacting all the time with me. But then I learn, I learn with ears to accept the silence, accept the conditions that I have that also add to my peace. In, they transform my peace, of course. And I have pleasure to be also in this space. And I love to talk with the audience after all my, my performance, because I think this is part of my performance. Also because uh, to, to make a point with the beginning of our conversation, when I mention ecology, because decolonizing is not far from ecology, it's completely linked, these two, these two concepts. It's very important for me at least, to think the world from this perspective. And so I, I bring, I, as a fly from very far, I have to meet these people. I have to try to, to, uh, to listen to them and to give information to this other part of the world, like a letter. I feel myself as a letter to address and to bring, uh, to bring all these voices that cannot travel, they cannot uh, sometimes express themselves because I speak not very well English, but I speak very well French, so I can address people in another way. So this for me is the beautiful part of uh, my life as an artist, is to be with completely different people and talking and listen. I love this. There is a question I would uh, like to raise to Vashti, um, because now we, we talked at the very beginning, and I don't think that we have to go too much into detail in which way um, global collaborations have come to a halt in this pandemic time. But perhaps to talk briefly about the function arts could have right now, because we are very restricted in our uh, ways of work, uh, but still uh, precisely now to understand the situation we're living in, or um, to deal with the vulnerability and, and uh, also the healing that it's needed, perhaps uh, with all the suffering that the, the pandemic also inflicts, what could be the, the role, function, the, sp the art space in this pandemic times? I believe that the role is to resist to the social attraction. I believe that we have to become a social agent. We have all different tendencies. Um, some artists are metaphysical, pure artists. They have to uh, stay that way. They have um, to be trustful to themselves, and they can't have the feeling that if they don't, they stop being artists. There's other artists for whom the presence of the social is very important, and this is very good too. What I rather think is dangerous at the moment is this injunction. One has to be social, one has to help people. Yes, that's true, but it's maybe not everybody's function. Not everybody has this affinity. You know, maybe in 10 years, there will be a different pandemic, a virus, and when this virus hits, one will realize that the only possible way of healing it is, um, is a performance. It's uh, like a Tarkovsky Solka, and this is uh, the vaccination against this virus. There's no other type of vaccine. All scientists say there's no vaccine. And suddenly, <laughs> some guy, some guy suddenly realizes, I realized that uh, somebody who was really ill with this new virus went to a show, he saw the performance, and then suddenly he was healed. And then suddenly, everybody realizes that metaphysical, unsocial artists are the vaccine for this virus. What will we do then? We will not be able to be Tarkovsky, all of us. We will not be able to improvise Hölderlin, each and every one of us. 
But what we can do is to not, not be wrong about yourself, to not lie to yourself about who you are, and not to start telling each other stories, saying, artists should do this or should do that. I have absolutely no idea. I just know that I have to ask myself, what is my language? And I can't betray my language. How do I write? From where do I write? There is this um, citation from Hölderlin, says, what use are poets in times of need? This is a phenomenal question today, especially since in France everything is closed. Um, malls are open, museums are closed. It's absurd, because you could walk around in a museum like you walk around in a mall, but museums are closed, churches are open, but theaters are closed. There's no logic to that. So the logic is that the government has decided that since it can't open everything, it has chosen, and it has chosen to close down culture and art in order to be able to open churches and malls. So what use are artists in times of need? If I asked the government who is taking the decisions it's taking right now, they would answer. They aren't really very useful. So starting from there, the temptation that I feel is to uh, think I have to help, I have to do this and that, and that we artists all start doing kind of the same things. By contrast, I say this all the more since I feel a dichotomy between myself and what is happening. My own language is a dichotomy. I'm not a, a social artist, socially engaged artist. I keep telling stories. I'm a narrator. I do very classical theater with replicas, with uh, stage directions, with uh, set design and decor changes. I'm a really classical guy. So I will not start changing now and stop being myself because suddenly I have to do something else. I think it is very important to not betray oneself and to not go wrong on oneself, to not change your own language, but to make it even more precise mm -hmm. instead of starting speaking a language that is not at all your own. Mm -hmm. For sure, the, the whole question of, of how uh, art institutions are allowed to operate or not in this time would be a, a whole new debate. And uh, I mean, we can... Um, we could share very similar uh, stories from Germany. Um, but since we are now talking about the pandemic situation, Milo, and, and you, uh, we, as we heard at the beginning, when the pandemic started, you were um, in Brazil, you were working with your Antigone in, in the Amazonas. Um, and probably this was a, since then, one year passed and, and many reflections uh, have been hunting all of us. What do you think did you learn or unlearn in the face of the pandemic regarding your practices? Um, I think one thing that uh, Vashti is very right is that uh, it's all a question of, of talent and of character. I mean, you are a good social worker and you are perhaps a bad artist or you're a good artist and a very bad social worker. And sometimes it comes together and somebody needs silence to work. For example, Marie Duras, she needed complete silence and if there was one sound, she couldn't concentrate anymore and others need a lot of people present. For example, myself, if I enter a space where is nobody waiting for something, at least five people, for me it's difficult to have one thought. I can't think alone, you know? I can't sit at home. I always need a collaboration, a public, somebody who, 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 would, who would think together with me, who would be in dialogue. So. Um, I, I, I learned a lot about my dependence from it. And I think, and perhaps I generalized too much, the dependency from theater from it, or from art from it. That you would have somebody who is in, 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 in front of you. And, uh, and then I started thinking, because of course the, 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 the government says you can't go back to your theaters, but why don't we play outside? 
you can't uh, play in artificial light inside, so let's play in, in real light outside. Let's have this kind of discussions if this is the only possibility that they can meet with all of you in one room. For example, I, I started in the last year to talk to much more people and much more different people than before. Even the idea of this of this school of resistance was born because it was impossible to to invite uh, our Antigone Kaisara uh, to to the to the Wiener Festwochen, the Vienna festival. So we said, okay, let's do it online. And uh, I think you search other ways of uh, of communication. And I hope that these channels, these solidarities, uh, stay alive when we don't need it anymore, mm. or that we still make these kind of, of meetings, even if we could have then 10,000 meetings here in Berlin, mm. you know? Uh, for me, the beginning of this, this discussion was the most interesting moment, because it was really like everybody in this round was saying the complete opposite what I think you were expecting that would be said. I don't know, <laughs> yeah? But that everybody would say, yeah, stop flying, stop. Because if you would have five people from Europe here, it, yeah. it would have been a discussion and then let's count the CO2 and et cetera, et cetera. So nobody would reflect on the kind of the inequality that it is in this kind of, 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 of let's say, upper class ecological view on, on the international distribution of art. But I, in a way, the, um, you could also argue that it's precisely the experts of change and those that can... Um, uh, land, uh, atterrir in a specific uh, social terrain, uh, that those should be the ones traveling. So I that's what I, I would completely agree with what Leah said, that if someone is flying and if someone is creating a, as, um, a footprint, ecological footprint, it should be these kind of people that have this, this talent or this expertise. Yeah, by the way, the flights are full with managers. I mean, you said the churches are open, but also the airports are open. So it's, it's, it's completely absurd. Mm. I mean, what we are, what we are, what we are talking here—that we want to cut down culture while everybody is continuing to distribute inequality all the time—and we are, we can be distributors of equality somehow, of solidarity. I mean, that's a bit naive, but that's, I think, uh, our role. And I think what what Vashti said to be precise in what we know to do. And if you are, I was, I was healed so many times by Pasolini. By the way, I was healed many times by Hölderlin. I'm a bit uh, afraid that nobody would expect this that I say that, <laughs> but uh, because I, I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm not the guy who would write a big elegy, and I'm not the guy who would do a play with many stage directions. So it's not my talent, but I love it, you know. And everybody has to be precise in his. Uh, in his field, and that's what has to be distributed. And if we cut the preciseness of Vashti and of, of Leah and of, of, of Rabia, and we say just, okay, uh, we can't fly anymore, then what will we distribute then? I think this, this also brings me already to, to a final round of questions to all of you. Um, a bit in the direction you, you were also mentioning the question of solidarity. So. In regards with, uh, to solidarity, in regards to um, cooperations, exchange, uh, also on a global scale, what are you, you fierce and you vicious for the future after the pandemic? If we, uh, on the one side, if we could imagine uh, the world as we would like to have it, but also the fears we have, because my, uh, from I myself, um, I think at the moment, because people, many people say now is the time to find answers. I'm more afraid of not of, of not finding a question than of uh, not finding an answer at the moment. So perhaps, what what is a world we ca we would like to imagine for the time after pandemic, Rabia? Regarding our our practices as <laughs> as, as, as artists that, that travel. Seriously, I have no answer about this. Um, I I for me like it's uh, it's it's. Uh, like it's a crisis uh, that, uh, and it's a period that it's of course important to 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 reflect upon it and to 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 see what comes out of it, what what we can learn out of it, yeah. Uh, because like there there's a lot of things happening in terms like if we are talking about live uh, performances. Uh, 
and this is specifically what what is important now we if we are all like doing dance theater performances like this is an issue that now we we are losing like if you do films or videos of course you miss uh, to show it in, in in a cinema but you can still do films in the same way as as before or videos or like an artwork a painting or but like theater where like there is a space a venue where people are gathering uh, this is what we lost but also what we gain huh? i think we gain we lost there is something uh, not uh, not uh, only negative there is some positive things uh, to think about about it with the relation with the audience uh, and the performer uh, i i uh, personally experienced this because i performed online uh, before the pandemic <laughs> you're an exception no it's maybe i'm i'm exception but like really i i i did the performances where like i was talking to a camera and like hidden in a theater but hidden and i have to speak to the audience and the audience didn't know that I am I'm I'm doing this live. They thought that it is a video recorded, but then they discovered that it's live. But I also at the beginning it was like really suffering like how to perform to a lens. So there's no audience. You have to perform to a lens. Huh? Uh, it's exactly what's happening now with uh, Wajdi and Leah. Now we are uh, lucky we are not in the same situation. You're looking to, to, to this lens. Uh, and and you have to, we have to imagine also the audience. Hopefully there are audience, but maybe not. <laughs> we wouldn't notice. But, but this is actually, this is, this, is what I'm th this is what is important. There is something like, uh, uh, there is a freedom for the audience, more freedom for the audience than before. Which I, I really think about it a lot. Like this freedom that this situation, when you perform online, of course you lose this uh, the chaleur, the, the warmth, warmness, yeah. uh, the, the bodies together, but also you gain something like now people can watch a performance in their beds. Uh, they can watch it while they are eating and drinking. They can even go to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> like, it's a crazy thing. It's really great for the audience. It's really great for us. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's bad. Uh, because also, I have to say, like, I had a dream. Long time. It's like a nightmare, actually. I always had it. And then suddenly it happened to me now in the pandemic, which, like, I always think, because I always want to to perform uh, and put the light off for the audience actually if someone wants to sleep don't feel embarrassed so they, i don't see him I, I will not be bothered and he will not or she will not be bothered but always i have this fear that maybe when the light on <laughs> I will see no audience at all. Everybody left. <laughs> and this happened to me on, on, uh, online, actually, when, when I was performing one day. And uh, I, I was like doing very well my role. <laughs> really, I was so happy. And when I'm done, I, 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 then I switched the... Because I was sharing my, uh, screen. my screen. Yeah. So I switched on and I discovered that it was the connection was cut there was no connection and i was performing for nobody at all and the funny thing that as usually happens all the time when there is a technical thing people think that it is part of the performance so they thought that it's part of the performance and they continued without me discussing between themselves what does it mean that he disappeared now but it's crazy. So I, I'm just telling anecdotes. But I have <laughs> nothing to, to add. Perhaps then, uh, then to you, Leah. What, what, do you, what are your expectations, but also your fears um, regarding um, global uh, exchange in regards to our practices um, and, and how we can share our work uh, in different places of the world? And also, and also regarding the, the, the attempts of, of solidarity that we talked so much about. Because on one hand, I am uh, very much, I have many fears, the real fears I feel in my body because I have to go back home next week. 
uh, to a, a country that is um, very high contamination. So I, I have concrete fears. I'm part of the population that is in the risk because of my age, no hospitals. Uh, so I, I have fears about my, my children if they are grow up, I have fears about how to to make, I don't know to make creations. I never try to make in a different way the work of dance. For me, it's together, uh, very close with a lot of people. I work, I love to work with a lot of people together. So I, I really don't know how to solve any of the, these problems. So I, it, when you ask my, uh, this question to me now, I can be very nervous because I am in this moment of going back and uh, not knowing how to begin my work. I have to think uh, for what I have to say, maybe it's the, I hope we are more aware about the complexity of our life, of our humanity, uh, our responsibility, responsibility uh, to uh, to the planet, to the other, to the difference, uh, and we have to learn to live with the trouble because things are not going to be uh, 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 good. <laughs> I don't have this dream. I know that's going to be very bad, but not. For me, maybe in the first time, of course, the first time who you, uh, the first person who you suffer is the poor, indigenous people, for example. So, how can we live with the trouble? As Donna Haroy uh, asked these questions in her beautiful book, is the question that I ask myself every day: uh, How make uh, this present moment more possible? Uh, I'm, I, I'm someone that works in a very small world because I don't have time to think too much bigger. Otherwise, I'm not able to do my work there in this specific place with these specific people around me. So I think I try to not think about your question in my daily life, uh, not think at all. Otherwise, I cannot move. And I need to move. I need to move to survive and and to make other people survive. I, I, I feel this responsibility. I cannot avoid this part of myself. Mm. Then perhaps, Milo, you want to, to continue? What is your perspective or your hopes and your fears for the time with and after the pandemic regarding your artistic work and the conditions under which we will operate? Um, I, I was working quite... I have to say quite quite fast uh, before the pandemic, and this was somehow stopped. And um, I started to develop, I don't know, another rhythm. I think during this this time, and um, and that's for me the. I mean, I can't expand too much about it. It's quite logic. So I, for example, I I felt again like a student. Uh, in the in this time and I was doing projects and not knowing if they will happen and I found out that that's why I made art not to have a premiere and to always land but to be in the state of 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 developing of sharing of, of of trying out you called it this kind of research phase when you are torturing yourself because I I describe it if it only would be fun but it's <laughs> it's also quite uh, quite strong because it was a relief to finally bring it out and uh, but to be confronted more to this and to give and we come now to the institutions again to perhaps more build places where you could do so mm. uh, myself others uh, uh, and so on and that that this is what it is about and uh, i very i hope and i, I do what i can uh, as with the little influence uh, we have um, to make that possible, that not this kind of produce tour, produce the next tour, tour parallelly, that this, this craziness uh, uh, changes. And um, yeah, that's my, that's what I learned out of it personally. Mm -hmm. And finally, dear Vashti, what, what is your outlook uh, regarding our practices, our forms of uh, engagement with others, um, 
with other artists in other places um, after the pandemic? And perhaps also, what are your fears uh, regarding this? Um, I don't have so many fears uh, outside of the concrete fears that I have for people that surround me, that are dear to me. During this pandemic, I have had people close to me that died and others that were born very close to me that um, exited the uterus of their mother and others who died. Oddly, however, I have a kind of conviction, a confidence in the power of life. When I say power of life, I mean that life continues in the way that weeds grow in between, uh, in between that um, persist. I see, of course, that um, what is very complex is the uncertainty, uncertainty with regards to time. Um, Rabia and I have experienced this when we were kids. Um, we were always told that the war would end in three months, and then three months and the next three months added up to nine years. So this relationship to time where you think this will end in six months, 12 months, you stop believing these kinds of sentences. So you gain a rather detached relationship to time. You only know for a fact that things will evolve and that the essential things persist. Theater will persist. I don't know in what shape, I don't know how I will be doing it in three years, but I know that this power of life is there and that it's powerful. And this awareness of people close to me that are dead and those that are born is a powerful metaphor for the things that will happen to me. Some things will die in me and other things that I don't know of yet will be born in my relationship to myself and in my relationship to others. And to conclude, I don't have a blind optimism, but it's an optimism that I have been given. I am pervaded by a feeling that something will not stop. I'm incapable to say what it is, but something will continue and we participate in this. The fact that we are having this exchange right now means that we're participating in the energy of this thing that will not cease. To conclude maybe with a word on solidarity that touches me a lot. Um, it has led me to think of a text that has been very important to me um, from Czech philosopher Jan Patochka, who was asking himself at some point, how can two people who are separated by everything be brought close to each other, people who hate each other, who shoot at each other? And Patochka was asking this question, what kind of solidarity could bring them together? He's, he said, um, solidarity of artists? No, they're not artists. That of intellectuals? Neither. And there he develops a concept that I think is very beautiful and truthful, it's the solidarity of the shaken, those who have been shook in their everyday lives through the fear that they have of the day and the night. And Jan Patochka says, we are all people that have been shaken. We all form the solidarity of the shaken. And we need to invest our lives entirely in that, in that fear in order to not betray the solidarity of the shaken. Because if we are looking for comfort, if we are retreating, if we don't participate, we suddenly become people who are cornered, who hide in the back while others are dying. So the question that we can ask ourselves is how can I serve 
with this thing that has shaken me, how can I serve others? By opening the rehearsals, by continuing to create in this place where we are, by assuming our responsibilities, and I'm coming back to this, by not betraying the language that is ours, by not changing our language, and by rendering it even more very powerful, even more impactful, to have the solidarity of those that have been shaken, and we have all been shaken at the moment. I'm, I'm grateful that you are pointing uh, this out, and I'm sure tomorrow there will be a debate at uh, 5 p.m. on the Revolt of Dignity with uh, Luca Casarini, Lorenzo Marsili and Ivan Sanier. And this will be one of the topics uh, we will try to pick up tomorrow at that talk. Now at 7 we will see uh, the movie, the making off of Milo's production Orestes in Mosul. For all those that are watching on Facebook, you have to switch um, to the p web page of Academie der Künste Berlin, which is www.adk.de, because otherwise, you know, Facebook questions of distribution, we had that on the first uh, night, uh, is a complex issue. And there will be an after talk to this um, uh, screening of the movie. And there will be Daniel Demoustier, the director of this making of documentation of your work. There will be three people who participate in the project Susanna Abdul Majid, Khalid Ravi, and Sardar Abdullah. And cultural theorist uh, Klaus Teveleit is joining. And the um, conversation will be hosted by my two colleagues. Elin Banken and Kasia Wojcik, who are also curators of the School of Resistance. And as you know, this, uh, the School of Resistance is somehow quite classical. It's like television. Uh, the, the program is running. You have to see it while, while it's announced. Uh, and I think it's also quite nice that we come back in these times of pandemic to such a classical form. <laughs> Don't do the on-demand thing. It's, there's, a, there's a set time uh, when you're invited to join and then we are gathered as a decentralized audience. For me, the last thing to say now is to thank all of you, Rabia, Milo, Lia, Vashti, merci, obrigado, and thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank Shukra. you. Yeah. Shukra. Ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. See you soon. Goodbye.